class to other uh, things like um, uh, um, dance lessons and what have you, and just seeing how people react, and they usually react quite um, uh, cautiously at first, not knowing quite what to make of these kinds of things, and then gradually when they become more comfortable, they get more well used. But we're trying to create that culture of thinking about our streets, not just as places to move cars or even to move cyclists or walkers, but places to be, places just to experience the city and the community. I'm going to hit on a couple of key asks. What am I doing, guys? Okay, I'm going to hit on a couple of key uh, pieces of work that we're working on that relate to various aspects of resiliency. The first is the Athletes Village uh, that many of you might have heard about or read about. We're very pleased with this, recently referred to as the greenest community in at least North America. And I'll speak to that, but you get a sense of, um, uh, of some of the, uh, the context. It's as close to being in our downtown as you can be without being in our downtown. Long before the Olympics were even a twinkle in our eye, Council set the goal of this becoming the greenest city in North America. And then when we uh, went after the Olympics, the idea was to transform it into the Athletes Village. But from plan to concept to ultimately uh, the actual construction, uh, an incredibly surreally rapid construction, as you can imagine, uh, for those of you who are used to seeing physical change happen uh, in a short time, this almost seemed to spring out of the ground in the context of, of, of a, a very tight uh, construction schedule. But you get a sense of the kind of context that we're working with, um, everything from built form and public realm design, uh, that we're very proud of and that has moved us uh, uh, a significant way forward in our learnings about mid-rise uh, building types and moving us away from this uh, lazy assumption that what Vancouver knows how to do best is boating and point out, and showing that we actually are very good at doing a, multiple, a multitude of different boat forms. So everything from the way we bring uh, the community together in the context of uh, preservation of historic buildings becoming a binding element in the new public realm around the community plaza, uh, integration of, of retail into that community heart, and that's going in uh, almost as we speak, uh, it's just started, the liquor store was the first thing to go in, and I'm not quite sure I understand that, but it's interesting. Uh, certainly a lot of investigation about built form uh, and different expressions, uh, a lot of thinking about how the public is going to use this space. I do believe this public square may become the most interesting and used once the area is fully populated, interesting and actively used public realm in the new, uh, in the new city. Integration of cultural facilities, heritage facilities, public art, etc. Uh, uh, urban agriculture built in. This is actually on the roof of, uh, of, a, of a building uh, where the ground floor and the multiple levels are big box retailing. Uh, this is above Home Depot. And uh, there's residential above Home Depot and there's a community garden and, and community uh, neighborhood activating uses above a Home Depot in the kind of built form I haven't seen anywhere else in North America so far. Uh, uh, <coughs> restoration of the natural environment, the creation of a natural habitat island. That's actually a gray whale that, that came into False Creek by accident uh, after we had constructed this habitat and done a lot of uh, habitat restoration. And then the gray whale came back a week later, not by accident, because they like it, it liked the food that it found. Uh, we have eagles have returned to False Creek and such a lot because of the, uh, the restoration that we put into the natural environment there. Right? Uh, and we've created also uh, uh, constructed and, and uh, both um, natural wetlands and semi-natural wetlands in the area. From a built form perspective, everything from passive design like uh, solar shading and extroverting of, of uh, facilities like the hallways or the staircases so that they don't need as much energy for heating and cooling and lighting, etc. This is all uh, very important to reducing your energy load on buildings to start with and all of these passive uh, aspects reduce the building load of the city by about four, uh, of the uh, neighborhood by about 40 percent to begin with. This is basic good architecture that North America has forgotten how to do for the last 50 or 60 years. European uh, cities know how to do this building. It's almost embarrassing for us when we take uh, uh, Europeans on a tour of this project because for them this is business as usual, but for North American cities they're just simply amazed at this architectural type. So other things like natural ventilation, natural heating and cooling, you know, this is all basic from a passive design perspective, but revolutionary by, by modern North American standards. The collection of rainwater, both in terms of uh, uh, rooftop uh, uh, gardens, 50% of the roofs in the entire village are green roofs. Uh, there's rain barrels that go down to the cisterns so that all the water is recycled into the water. 
Um, this is uh, one of the buildings. All of the buildings had to be a minimum of lead gold. Um, the, the, uh, the community center and this building are at least lead platinum. And this one is actually uh, is going to be our first net zero building. And uh, they're just doing the final math on it to see if we got there and hopefully we have lead carbon credits to be able to achieve the, the, the statement that it's uh, net zero. On that roof of that building is a solar array. Uh, it's interesting to date on a cost-benefit perspective in Vancouver about whether solar is a good idea, given that we have a lot more rain than we have sun, so the rain barrels and cisterns made more sense, but we are doing some uh, installations on solar as well. The most interesting thing above, uh, above and beyond the, the building-related insertions is that the entire village is off the grid from a heating perspective. Uh, it's our first significant district energy system. Sewer heat recovery is the, is the technology. It essentially captures the waste heat from the sewer systems and uses it to heat all of the buildings uh, within the neighborhood and, and the much broader neighborhood, not just the athletes' village. So that's online now uh, and a remarkable achievement. And all of these things have fundamentally already changed the way that Vancouver does all of our work. One of the things I was most proud of is that even before the athletes' village was open, we had taken what we'd learned about district energy and built it into a new citywide district energy policy. We had taken every learning we had on passive design and used it to change our zoning bylaw to remove barriers to green design and create incentives. The agricultural learnings had been translated into a citywide agricultural design guidelines. You name it, uh, and it had already changed business as usual before the Athletes Village was even open. One of my great frustrations in cities is that they do something they call a model. And even 10 years after that model, business as usual in the city, in all of the other projects in the city, hasn't fundamentally changed. So we set out to do that differently here. So even before it was open, did it change business as usual? Because, oh, sorry. Um, this is, I'm going to switch gears now. This is Canby Corridor. I was asked to speak about this one. Okay. Um, very quickly, this is one of our uh, uh, most significant uh, approaches to transit-oriented design. This is uh, uh, planning around the new Canada Line that was opened in time for the Olympics, like connecting the airport to downtown. So we've been doing an awful lot of work in terms of planning, particularly significant density increases along the corridor itself. Uh, still recognizing that regardless of it being a corridor, it's still part of a city of neighborhoods, which is how we think of ourselves. So still recognizing the contextual approaches as we move along the corridor. And, and gradually communicating in ways, frankly, better than we have in the past, what that kind of built form is going to look like as we go along the corridor, so that people know that it isn't towers everywhere, it isn't even significant enterprise everywhere, it's these various kinds of built forms as we move along the corridor, leading to one place where there's going to be high rises, and, and, and not a surprise, this has become very controversial, but it's just one station along the entire line where the majority of the station is actually going to be mid-rise. And we're doing more than we've ever done to actually test the metrics and the performance, whether it's population growth, job growth, carbon reductions, uh, uh, mode shift. We partnered with the University of British Columbia in a modeling exercise to be able to actually measure and show what the, what the different built form changes are actually going to result in from a performance perspective. Switching gears again, uh, job space protection is a significant issue in terms of resiliency in our city. And this is a, a map showing the actual areas of the city of Vancouver that are not allowed to include residential. And one of the things I like to uh, reference is, is what I call sometimes this, the, the lure of sexy mixed use. And this is a bit of a weird thing for me to be saying as a planner in a city that has really pioneered approaches to mixed use. But the, the important thing to remember from our perspective and from many other cities' perspective that have to do a better job at this is here's our picture. We've got about 90% of the land area of the city of Vancouver that allows residential. Only 10% of the land area doesn't. But 50% of the jobs in the city of Vancouver are on that 10% of land. And also, they're the only kind of jobs that relate to manufacturing, distribution, the kind of old industry kind of jobs that, you know, the narrative says have disappeared, and they haven't. They're still a fundamental uh, part of our economy. And in fact, they may become a growing part of our economy. If you read books like Jeff Rubin's book, which talks about the re return to local manufacturing, the relocalization of manufacturing, it'll be the cities that have the ability to return that local manufacturing base to their city because of the high cost of transportation, for example, that will actually be more resilient in the future. Most cities are giving away their industrial land right now to mixed use. 
We made our reputation as a city by doing that, but now we're being much more careful with the land that we have left because we're projecting that we're going to